Hey guys, I'm really excited to bring you what is a huge jump forward in my cargo trailer to camper project. I've got the walls in. So I'm gonna go over the insulation, the support members I added, a cedar, tongue and groove, everything. So check it out. If you have any questions, put them in down below. I try to get to everyone. And uh, otherwise, make sure you stick to the end. I have a bunch of tips in here that I hope are gonna save you a lot of time. Throughout the cargo trailer, there's an inch and a half of insulation. The first layer goes directly up against the shell of the cargo trailer, and it slides behind the studs. The studs are kind of shaped like a Z or an S, and one side is flat against the outside shell, the other side is offset by an inch. So they're kind of held in place on their own, but I tried to get each one to fit pretty tightly. I cut most of it with a T-square, it's like a sheetrock T-square, um, and a razor knife. Um, but I also did use the table saw sometimes to get um, long cuts that were precise. Unfortunately, a lot of the studs in the cargo trailer are not square, so they might be, you know, at the bottom it might be an 18 inch gap, at the top it's a 19 inch gap. Um, so there was a lot of custom pieces made. Once I got up all the pieces cut, then I went back through and I wanted to address the trailer wiring. It bugged me that all of the wiring that went to the side lights came down from the top of the trailer. I'm sure that makes a ton of sense when they're manufacturing it because they wire up the, all the wiring to the roof of the trailer and then drop it on and then run it down. But for me, it made sense to just have the wires running across the length. It uses a lot less wire and then I have less areas that I have to fish it through. So the wiring I drilled holes for in order to get the wiring inside the first inch of insulation. And then in that insulation, I also routed channels, and that's what you're seeing here, with a little trim router and a half inch dado bit. I cut a channel that I could stuff the wires into. And I did this on all the pieces, as you'll see here. So once all of the channels were cut, I went back through and put all the marker lights together. I stripped and crimped together all the wires. Um, each time I made a connection, I added on additional wire length in order to go to the next light. Um, luckily, I was able to use, utilize all of the trailer wiring or the extra pieces that came with the trailer, so I didn't have to spend any money on extra wiring here. One of the other things that this allows me to do is I can connect up these marker lights to my internal battery of the cargo trailer. So if I want to unplug it from the truck and then just flip on the marker lights all around the trailer, I can. I thought that was actually a pretty neat idea for say like when I'm parked in a truck stop. Um, a lot of the times you see all of the tractors have their lights on and I assume that's for safety so that when someone's pulling in they're definitely going to see them. So I think that'd be nice to be able to do here with the, the cargo trailer camper. I did the same thing on the other side of the trailer. The only difference here is that there is an additional wire that I ran through in the same area, and that's gonna go to my little refrigerator. Um, so that is a 12 gauge wire, marine grade, that runs from the front um, to right below the window. And you'll see that sticking out in other videos. You also notice that I used some of the foam adhesive tape in order to hold all those wires in place so they didn't flop around as I was adding on the next layer of insulation.
Up next, I needed to add something that I could tack all of the wall covering to, the cedar tongue and groove strips. So I took two by fours and once again, cut them down to half an inch thick on the bandsaw. That's what you're seeing here. And then I use those vertically against the metal studs in order to, um, like I said, create a surface that I could nail to. Since all the interior vertical furring strips were going to be the same length, I grouped them together and cut them to length. Up next, I had to mark where the wires were going to be going behind the furring strips and cut channels again with the router. In the cases where there was more than one wire passing through, I did cut multiple channels here so that each one had its own groove. I mounted the furring strips to the steel studs of the trailer with some sheetrock screws that are designed to be self-tapping and go into metal 2x4s. It surprised me actually, they were pretty easy to use on the trailer. I thought maybe the tips wouldn't be sharp enough, but it worked perfectly. One of the things that was really important is that I pre-drilled those holes in the furring strips larger than the screws because as you're going through these strips, if the hole isn't larger than the diameter of the screw threads, then it keeps on pulling the furring strip away from the metal as you're trying to drill into it. Um, I also went through with a countersink and just quickly hit each hole allowing the um, sheetrock screw to really pull up to it without splitting these thin half inch strips. So you'll see here, um, adding them in was pretty easy. You just put it where you want it and start screwing. The first bit, you'll notice it's just drilling the hole And then it actually starts to pull it in. I used a level to make sure that they were standing up straight. I wanted to be able to then use these, unlike the studs, as reference points. You'll see there I've also got the window opening already cut out. A lot of this video was shot in uh, or actually a lot of these processes were done in different order than I'm putting this video together uh, because I often did something and then had to take it apart in order to do a previous step and so forth. But I think if I were doing it again, this would go so much faster because I now know exactly what needed to get done and hopefully that's something you're getting out of this video. You'll see I put a small one inch spacer behind the stud uh, to support the outside wall where the window was gonna go. Here is a perfect example of now taking everything out, going back and putting in additional supports in the walls so that I could mount my L track. But in the meantime, I took out all of the insulation in order to do that and um, had to cut some of that wiring that I did previously. So I've got all of these in place, provides a lot of extra structure um, to the walls, and it'll really support this aircraft L-Track. You notice I marked all the holes and I drilled four rivet nuts to go inside there. Um, as I'm drilling, I made sure to have a putty knife behind where the hole was being made so that when I punched through at the end of the hole, it didn't end up going into the aluminum siding, which is the outside of the cargo trailer uh, and pushing a hole through. I really didn't want to do that. So then these are the rivet nuts. They're um, a quarter 20 
and you put them into this rivet device, put them into the hole, which I believe was 5 16th, and then you crimp them down. There's, you have to kind of get used to the feel. If you over crimp, it can be problematic. If you under crimp, obviously problematic. Um, they're not a perfect solution for everything, but they work pretty well here because I have them every six inches or so, which really connects that L track up to the structure of the camper. So also behind the L track, I used some of that extra material from the furring strips that you see here uh, and use that as a spacer between the L track and the wall of the camper. I wanted to have these stick out from the siding or from the cedar that was on the walls just a little bit, um, but not have it on top of the cedar for the walls sticking out that full half an inch. Overall, I think it came out nicely um, the way that it is. So I put all these uh, screws in. They're a inch and a half stainless quarter 20 with a um, hex head as the driver. I was really surprised at how sturdy this all became and actually how much it strengthened up the side of the trailer once it was all in place. If you haven't already seen my flooring video, then you actually might not know what these tracks are for. So these are tie down points. When I don't have the bed in the, in the little cargo trailer, I'll have the ability to use all kinds of tie downs to hold a motorcycle, to hold things against the walls, whatever I want to do in here. Um, and then the second set of fasteners is actually the fasteners that I'm going to use to hold the bed to the wall and the floor. So it serves multiple purposes. I'll put links to the track down below in the description. Cutting out the windows. So this is one of the processes that I did a few times on the cargo trailer. You'll notice here there isn't any structure in place um, that's around the windows. And that's because it was pretty early in the build. I had the intention of cutting in the windows and having them in place once, but the more that I thought about it, it made sense for the windows to be clamped around the entire width or the entire thickness of the furring strips and the one inch um, studs. Because of that, I put in the windows at this point and then I later took them out and put them back in uh, with the full thickness. Now the other big thing that I learned here is that the jigsaw really isn't the right tool for this job, in my opinion. I saw a lot of videos of people doing these cuts with the jigsaw, and so that's why I used it. But every time I got close to the studs, I couldn't manipulate the jigsaw. And I also didn't want to do this from the outside because the foot pad of the jigsaw has a potential of really scratching up the paint. And I didn't want to use a ton of tape in order to protect the paint on the outside, um, as well as transfer all my markings to the outside. So the first window I cut out with the jigsaw, which is what you're seeing here. And then the next window, I cut out with the same tool that I used for my teardrop style side door. Um, I'll link the video here if you want to check that out. And I'll actually show you a little clip here of how that um, air nibbler works. Video from the side and you see how quickly it just nibbles away the aluminum was much easier than all this back and forth with the jigsaw. And then if that wasn't enough fun with the jigsaw, I had a couple places where I still had to complete the cut with a little handheld 
hacksaw, which you can see was really going perfectly here. With the hole fully cut out, I was able to weld in the supports or cross members that would go between the studs above and below the window. For that, I used the one inch square tubing that I've been using elsewhere in the build. I should mention that I've seen a lot of other people using wood for this purpose, and that would be perfectly fine. It'd certainly be cheaper. Um, I felt like I could get a better connection and end up with a stronger trailer that would sustain more off-roading uh, if I used metal and welded it in place. Uh, with the window holes finally cut and the cross members in place, I was able to build out the rest of the furring strips. And here you see the second time that this window was mounted in place. The first time it had been in there for a few days um, and it was that smaller one inch depth that it was covering. Now it's around the inch and a half of the furring strips plus the one inch trailer sidewalls. Went around, you know, much like you mount a tire and tightened each one opposite crisscross. The little suction cup that you see on the window was really handy for holding it in place while I was mounting it. This is where I actually started to build some momentum. So I now had the first inch of insulation in, all the wiring set, the furring strip set, the L track set, the windows in. I was finally getting to a place where I could actually move forward on most of this. So the last half an inch of insulation would go in between all the furring strips. And then I used this uh, tape that's designed for holding foam. And it also works as a vapor barrier. Along the way, I took the time to add in another feature. Um, I wanted to have a little bedside lamp that would allow me to charge via USB as well. So I could have my phone there at night at the bedside. So I ran that wire and then continued doing the rest of the insulation. I ended up using an entire roll of that tape in this project. It was expensive tape, it was 11 bucks. Um, and you probably could use packing tape. I did use packing tape for a couple of pieces at the very end and it stuck almost as well. Um, your mileage may vary. The second side of the trailer was a little more difficult to mount all the furring strips just because there were more um, different sizes that had to be uh, created. That area that I'm working on now will also have my little on-off switch for the lights that are mounted in the roof. So that's the white wire that you see coming down there. It'll be integrated dimmer and on-off. So when I'm popping in the side, I can just hit the on-off button and have lights inside. Here I'm mounting the L-Track to the passenger side of the camper. I cut that piece down from six feet to, uh, I think it was about two and a half feet. And I'm gonna have that other two and a half feet to use uh, probably outside the camper. And I haven't figured out exactly what yet, but stay tuned. This ends up being a fairly long video. Um, I wasn't sure if I should divide it up into multiple parts or if I should just put it all together in one. I feel like because there are so many of these pieces that are kind of intertwined in the build that it made sense to release them all together. Let me know down below, you know, in the comments, do you appreciate a longer detailed video like this or would you rather just kind of see an overview? What, what do you think is the most helpful? I'd, I'd really like to know. This was another huge milestone to hit to finally be putting the cedar on the walls. So this product is a quarter inch cedar tongue and groove that they sell at Home Depot. It comes six strips in a shrink wrapped package. Um, and that makes it a little difficult because you don't get to choose the pieces that you get. I would say that out of a package of six, 
two of the boards probably had significant holes or knots or damage to the tongue groove in some way. Um, and then another two boards or one board, one to two boards, would have some minor damage. So what I found was really helpful is that I opened them all up and sorted through them before I started putting anything on the wall. Because of that, I was able to take advantage of pieces that were damaged in different ways and use them in areas where I didn't need to use a full length piece. Um, for example, this piece that I'm putting in right now was actually damaged on the bottom, but I was able to cut that part of that section away and use it to surround the L track. The other thing to note is that the, the cedar really does need a little bit of time to dry. I expected that it came from the factory fully dried, but I noticed that when I left it out in my garage overnight, um, it did do some warping, um, some cupping. And so I then gave it a couple more days to just kind of acclimate to the temperature of my garage and to the humidity level. After that, I don't, I haven't seen any um, signs that it's been drying out while it was up on the walls, but we'll see, you know, over time, this camper's gonna go through a lot of temperature swings and it's, you know, hopefully gonna be pretty dry in there. So we'll see if these boards start um, opening up along the, the splits. I hope not. The thing that slowed me down the most when I was putting in the strips is the cuts around the window. And uh, stay tuned for a tip a bit later on cutting the windows out. Uh, the first thing that I was using was a compass to scribe the outsides of the window frame in order to get the cutouts as close as possible to match them. This took a significant amount of time and a number of back and forths each time to get right. So the first little bit when I was putting these, the siding in went really fast. Once I got to the windows on both sides, it slowed down significantly. Once I had a good line to cut along, I used the jigsaw to make the cuts. Used a brand new blade here because I didn't want to splinter the wood at all. Um, you know, this is just a quarter inch thick piece of cedar, so it is really easy to damage it. Um, so anyway, brand new jigsaw blade, ultra fine. But even then, you know, it took a number of tries. So I would make the cut, draw where I needed to make adjustments, and then go back and make another cut. Eventually though, I was able to get it to fit really nicely.
Okay, so here's the shortcut that I wish I had known at the beginning and only found out on the last corner of the window. All along, I had these green templates of arcs, and the one on there marked 90 is the perfect window arc. So all I had to do is line it up with the trim, sketch it out, and make the cut. It was so much easier. I'll put a link down in the description below in case you come across this. They're so handy to have those semi-transparent um, green overlays to get that perfect sketch the first time, cut it, you're done. Oh my God, what a time saver. Well, if you've made it this far, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you haven't already, it'd be awesome if you click the like button and go ahead and subscribe. I've got a bunch more videos coming out on this build. Um, up next, I'm gonna have my countertop with my sink that's going in the Vinos that you've seen previewed here, but I've got a whole build video for it. Anyway, I'll see you later, guys. Thanks again.